The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome. I'm the Reverend Keith McPherson, the minister at Park Royal United Church here in Charlottetown, PEI. And thank you for dropping by and spending some time in worship with us today. As is our custom at Park Royal, we open our worship service by sharing good news moments. And please send those in to my uh, email, keithparkroyal at eastlink.ca, and I'll uh, share them in our services. Uh, before I share the good news moments, though, I want to uh, thank our music team this morning, Sharon Cameron and Steve Ellis. We're very grateful for them sharing their gifts with us today. And as always, a thanks to Roddy for coordinating our audio and video today. So Kathy Pilkington wrote in to say that today, Sunday, September 27th, our mom, Betty Lewis, celebrates her 91st birthday. And she sends love from her, Ron, and Stuart, and all the grandchildren. So best wishes from Park Royal Betty on this, your 91st birthday. So happy cake and ice cream day. We light our Christ candle this morning. Jesus said to the disciples, you are the light of the world. We carry within us the light of Christ's love. So please join me in our opening litany. Caring teacher, so often we come to you with our questions. Where are you? What should I do? Why me? Other times we put questions in your mouth, assuming your main concern is our moral behavior. Were we judgmental? Did we give enough? Loving, nurturing, and at times challenging God, your actual questions often surprise us. Freely ask them, ask them of us today, for our hearts are open to hear them. Question us, teach us, and guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, then wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Thou reignest in glory, thou rulest in light, thy angels adore thee, all veiling their sight, all praise we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Hi boys and girls, 
It's Reverend Keith from Park Royal United Church with the word for all ages this week. Have your parents ever asked you to help out around the house by doing some chores? I'm sure that's probably happened to you. When I was a boy growing up on our farm, I used to have to do chores too. I used to take in firewood, and then when I got older, I'd uh, do some work in the barn. I used to climb up into the loft and throw hay down to feed the cattle, and then I used to clean the cow stable. This morning I'm going to uh, tell you a story about a father who had two children, a son named John and a daughter named Laura. One day the dad walked into John's room to find him building a model airplane. John, we had a lot of wind last night, and there are leaves scattered all over the yard. Would you play, please rake those leaves up and put them in these trash bags? Aw, oh, Dad, I don't have time to rake the leaves. I'm working on this model airplane, and I really want to finish it today, John answered. The father turned and left the room and went to look for Laura. He found her watching TV. Laura, there are a lot of leaves in the yard. Would you please rake the leaves and put them in these bags? Dad asked. Sure, I'd be glad to, answered Laura. Great, said Dad. I'll leave the rake and the trash bags in the yard. After his father left, John began to think about what he had asked him to do. Uh, I can rake the leaves and still have plenty of time to finish my model airplane later, John thought to himself. He went outside and began raking the leaves. When Dad returned home, he saw John raking the leaves. Where is Laura? he asked. I don't know. The last time I saw her, she was watching TV, John replied. When Dad went into the house, guess what he saw? There sat Laura, still watching TV. Now, I wonder, which of the two children pleased their father? John, who said he wouldn't rake the leaves, but did? Or Laura, who said she would rake the leaves, but didn't? In our Bible lesson today, Jesus told a similar story to show how different people act upon what God has called them to do. In Jesus' parable of the two sons, the father asked both sons to go work in his vineyard. Now a vineyard is like a farm where grapes are grown to eat and to make wine. Just as the two children in my story, the son answered no, but went and worked. The daughter Laura answered yes, but did not go. In telling the story, Jesus wanted us to realize that what we do is more important than what we say we will do. Jesus wants us to answer yes when he tells us to love one another, but what he really wants is for us to love one another. Jesus wants us to answer yes when he says, follow me. But what he really wants is for us to follow him. He wants us to love one another, to be kind with each other, and to make sure that everyone has what they need. So let us have a prayer. Dear God, Sometimes we say yes, but our actions say no. Help us to be faithful, to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's continue with the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening to my story today. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. The New Testament reading is taken from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. The authority of Jesus questioned. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you why, by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, eh, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as the prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The Parable of the Two Sons What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. And Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him.
with our text today, we have jumped ahead in Matthew's Gospel to a point after Jesus' entry to Jerusalem. Jesus and the disciples have left the familiarity and relative security of the Galilee in the north for the more dangerous and foreign landscape of the south, the province of Judea and the temple city of Jerusalem. It's the festival of the Passover and the city of approximately 30,000 has swelled to 180,000 or more with pilgrims converging on the city from around the Mediterranean basin. Passover was by far the most popular of the three Jewish festivals that required all Jewish males to visit the temple. For a number of reasons, real or imagined native Judeans looked down their noses at their northern cousins. They were regarded as the country bumpkins. They spoke Aramaic with a distinct accent. Certainly the north was a more ethnically diverse region. It was influenced by pagan and Hellenistic culture found in cities like Tiberias and Sephorus. The north had enjoyed a more independent administration far longer than the south. In the times of Jesus, they were ruled by one of the native Herod princes, while the south was under the direct control of a Roman prefect. There was also some envy on the part of the Judeans toward the Galileans, because of their rich agriculture and fishing wealth, compared to the rocky, mountainous, and less hospitable territory they inhabited. In general, the, Judean, the, Judean, the Judeans regarded the Galileans as being laxer in their religious observances and rituals, a problem they surmised was due to their distance from the temple and its leadership. So this background sets the scene for all the events that will transpire over the course of the week in Jerusalem as Jesus, the Messiah, proclaims so by all who have encountered his presence, becomes known to the chief priests and elders of Jerusalem. Many times throughout the journey south, Jesus has predicted the ultimate outcome of his life and teaching, rejection, condemnation, and death. Three major and dramatic events have occurred in Jerusalem, witnessed to by the Passover crowds gathered at the city walls and around the temple courtyard. One, the procession to the city gate. Number two, the attack on the traders in the temple courtyard. And three, the destruction of the fruitless fig tree. All of these events have provoked whispers and conversations and rumors about the mystical teacher from Galilee. Is he the Messiah? Is he a prophet like John the Baptist? The chief priests and the elders of the people come up to Jesus while he is teaching to the crowds. Now they represent the duly constituted leadership of the temple. And they represent all things pertaining to the religious life of Judea. They walk a very fine line between answering to the Romans and to the people they represent. So we can understand their concern about this northerner, Jesus, from the backwater village of Nazareth, whose appearance in their midst has been stirring up the Passover crowds. He's a threat to their position. And as they see it, a potential threat to the safety and security of those they serve. The questions they pose to Jesus concerns his authority. Who does he think he is? In, style, in the style of the traditional rabbinic teaching methods, 
he answers their question with another question. Jesus asks, who do you think John the Baptist was? After all, they, the Pharisees and Sadducees, along with all the people of Jerusalem and all Judea, had gone out to the wilderness region by the Jordan to be baptized by John for the forgiveness of sins. So clearly there was a recognition by this group now questioning Jesus of who John was. And then by implication and witness who indeed Jesus had been revealed to be. Although Jesus' answer may seem evasive, his hearers would have made the connection that he was a true prophet in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets and that he, like John the Baptist, spoke with the authority of God. I think the primary teaching for us today lies not in the question of Jesus' authority, but in the fact that Jesus sees in the leaders questioning him the incongruity between what they say they are and what they actually do. Between what they say they believe and what their actions reflect. That's always a great discipleship question for us to consider. Are the ways we live integrated with what we believe are the core values of Jesus' ministry and teachings? As Christians, we talk the talk, so to speak, but do we walk the talk? That is the lens through which we are to examine our behavior and actions with one another and in the community. Since the chief priests and elders skirted Jesus' question, although they clearly knew the answer, Jesus feels no obligation to answer their question on authority directly either. Instead, he offers up three parables. One is part of this week's lection, and the remaining two we will look at on other Sundays. Again, Jesus asks a question this time regarding a man and his two sons, who he asked to do work in the family's vineyard. One replies that he can't go, but later changes his mind and goes. The other son, upon his father's request, immediately says yes, but he never goes. Which of the two did the will of his father, asked Jesus. And this time, the chief priests have no trouble answering that the son who said no, but later changed his mind. I feel like at this point, maybe a loud buzzer would be appropriate, uh, like those game shows where you give it an incorrect answer and it goes wrong before Jesus responds. Once again, Jesus' point is around matching your words and what you say with your actions and what you do. Jesus condemns this kind of leadership that he sees reflected by the chief priests and elders who assume that their privilege will qualify them to the kingdom of God. Jesus points out that they went out to John at the Jordan were baptized, but they continued to live in ways that only enhanced their status, wealth, and privilege, while the poor and reviled in their midst, the prostitutes and tax collectors, remained on the lowest rungs of the social ladder. The tax collectors and prostitutes lived differently after their encounter with John at the Jordan. They changed their minds because of John, but the chief priests and the elders of the people did not. For that reason, Jesus tells them that those they would consider the most lowly and would thank God they were not among their ranks would be the first 
in the kingdom of heaven. And so if they didn't answer the call from John to repent and change, then surely they will not change for the Galilean mystic from Nazareth with the strange accent. As I said earlier, the text for me raises the question of integration of our Christian values with what we believe and what we do. But it also raises for me the question of how my inaction or my lack of engagement and maybe worst of all, my silence can legitimize injustice and systems of oppression. I think for me, my privilege can blind me to the experience of others who endure racism, homophobia, and climate injustice. But the voices of the prophets call out to us from climate strikers, Black Lives Matter protesters, indigenous land and water protectors, and the big mocky right to a moderate fishery folk. Will we listen and respond? Will we be a people who answer the gospel demand for justice and righteousness? By the grace of God, may it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join our hearts in our pastoral prayer. Loving and gracious God, we come before you today with grateful hearts, thankful that we live here close to the land and water, and grateful for the natural beauty of creation that surrounds and sustains our bodies and spirit. May we live with respect and care for this great gift we all share. Holy One, we come today with many concerns on our hearts, worries for our world, our families, and neighbors, and ourselves. We pray for those facing danger and despair in these times, remembering especially the people of Mi'kma'ki trying to exercise their treaty rights, their treaty fishing rights in the Maritimes. We pray for those facing daily unrest and violence, particularly in the United States, where Black Lives Matter protests continue in the wake of systemic racism and injustice. We pray for those challenged by the coronavirus pandemic and measures to control it, particularly in our own country where cases have been rising. We lament, O oh God, the death of over 200,000 persons from COVID-19 in the United States. And we pray for those who work to relieve suffering in these places and those working to bring justice and peace. Bless them all with your courage. O oh God, we pray for all those wrestling with sorrow or discouragement in any, in any area of their lives, for those living with illness or pain, for those bearing up with chronic conditions or disability, for those who know the grief and change of bereavement. We remember the families of West Prince grieving the loss of their children in a boating accident. God of love, we pray for all those who work to bring healing and comfort and all those agencies which offer support and care in our community. Bless them all with your compassion. We pray for all who feel helpless or hopeless in this present time, for those facing unemployment, struggling to make ends meet, for those caught up in the pain of misunderstanding or broken relationships, for any working through situations of conflict at home or at work. 
And we pray for all who offer guidance and support to face these challenges. And for those who lend skills in reconciliation or mediation. Bless all these with your wisdom and patience. God, of all our days, continue to guide us, encourage us, and inspire us to meet the challenges before us. And give us the strength, courage, and commitment to keep following in the way of Jesus. Amen. Looking at the community happenings this week, I have a COVID-19 update. The Park Royal official board met on Sunday, September 20th, and voted to resume in-person worship tentatively to begin on Sunday, October 11th. We want to continue to provide an online worship option via the internet through live streaming. So the equipment uh, to accomplish this has been ordered and uh, we'll need some time to be installed and uh, tested. Initially, the in-person service will be limited to a maximum of 50 persons and this number will be evaluated as we move forward in following the Chief Public Health Office guidelines. So there'll be further announcements of how the services will be organized forth, forthcoming. It's now possible for clergy to visit in the hospitals. So if there's a need, uh, I, will, I will be checking uh, the hospital uh, on a weekly basis, but if there's a need uh, that you have, please uh, let the office or me know about that. I'd also draw your attention today to the orange shirt uh, campaign uh, that happens all over uh, Canada. It's a reminder of the uh, residential school, uh, the indigenous regi residential school issues. And uh, it's a, uh, it reminds us of uh, that uh, sad and uh, tragic period in our country's history. And it reminds us of those persons that are still living the effects of the residential school experience. So if you remember on that day, on the 30th, to wear an orange shirt, send me a picture and I'll try to uh, get it up in next week's service. Uh, looking at other uh, announcements, the Board of Stewards will be holding a meeting, an important meeting this Wednesday in person at 6.30 uh, to discuss the uh, public health guidelines and how we are to organize ourselves for in-person worship. Also, I'd note uh, if you are able to help with ushering, uh, if you would please call the office and uh, let Donna know if you're able to do something like that uh, and we'll uh, keep your name on reserve because we'll certainly need uh, a good uh, complement of ushers uh, for our services. Even though we are not physically meeting the work of the church as you know, continues, and we are very grateful that the gifts through PAR and envelopes and online continue to come in. And so let us have a blessing prayer. Loving God, we offer these gifts in gratitude, wonder, and awe, aware of the many ways that you bless our lives each and every day. We ask your blessing on the fruit of our labors that it may be used to further the work of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference.
difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. We are the salt of the earth, called to let the people see the love of God for you and me. We are the light of the world, not to be hidden but be seen. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. We are the hands of Christ reaching out to those in need. The face of God for all to see. We are the spirit of hope. We are the voice of peace. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. So let your love shine on. Let it shine for all to see. Go make a difference in the world. And the Spirit of Christ will be with us as we go. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Dear friends, go out into the week and celebrate the goodness of God's love and grace that is present all around in the world. And know that you are loved and blessed beyond measure. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the nurture of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.